This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, if you just uh, want to follow along with this live show, it's available at the following URL, so you can type it in your mobile phone. You will see everything that I'm talking about on your screen. So I'll just leave a second for you if you want to type it in. Okay, so thank you for joining this talk uh, where I'm going to share a few tips about properly scaling your development team. But before I do that, I'll first introduce myself. So my name is Domago Goyak. Uh, I'm a lead developer at Slijek. We are a small company based in Split, Croatia, which uh, basically use WordPress to deliver uh, fully customized themes and fully customized solutions to both foreign and domestic clients. Uh, I'm coming also from Split Croatia, which is a small Mediterranean town, which is 1,700 years old. Uh, we are <laughs> lately most popular for Game of Thrones scenes made in Split. <laughs> so you might have seen a few scenes that were made in the Declation's basement. And uh, we are also popular for hosting the biggest Europe's uh, ultra event music festival. So. And we are a small town, basically 180,000 people live here. And now why this talk? So basically WordPress is going and in fact it's the fastest growing CMS solution at its moment. And traditionally growth equals more work, more work equals more, more people, and finally more people equals scaling. So we started small. When it kept Growing, we're still small, but we try to employ as much as people possible, and we wanted to share our experience with uh, what you need to do to properly scale your web team. And I'm a programmer; I'm not a project manager, so I have different set of questions that bother me. And the most important issue that I'm bothered with is that every team member is unique. Basically, every person is unique with his own set of preference. So uh, we need to address this main issue in some way or another. So problem number one is that people people tend to do things differently. And by doing so I mean uh, by telling so I mean that uh, some people like to use one set of tools to do certain things and another set of people like to use a different set of tools to do the same thing. And not everybody c came in into programming by, uh, by starting with WordPress. Some of them started with maybe another CMS solution or another, uh, or maybe they started by themselves writing custom code. So everybody's used to some form of different structure, code, and so on. So that leads us to problem number two, that, that is the uh, code becomes harder to read, test, and maintain because of different set of rules that you need to follow with different solutions and different languages. And with that, the collaboration between 10 members becomes a nightmare. So they don't uh, know how to agree on a certain set of rules that they will follow a certain set of tools maybe. And the overall product quality starts to drop and people become unsatisfied, both clients and programmers. So if we write down all the issues that you may encounter, and this is just a few, like poor code readability, slow setup, Two developers cannot work on the same file at the same time, and so on. There is a large number of problems that we can write down now, but we can all we can categorize all of them into four different categories, and those are different <coughs> development environments, which is pretty standard, pretty normal thing, because not everybody uses Mac or a Windows machine. They tend to use different environments. Uh, also, insufficient or lacking uh, quality con uh, control of the code. That's the one of the main reasons I'm doing this talk. And a large amount of different or missing dev tools and the lacking revision control system, which is not really common, but people don't use it properly. So let's fix those four problems by introducing environment visualization, version control, code quality control, and state-of-the-art toolbox or tool belt. So uh, environment visualization. Uh, 
virtualization isn't anything new, so it's been with us for a while. We all heard of it. Basically, in the old days, there was a some guy programmer uh, that made a machine on its virtual box or something like that, and he basically did, did everything manually, installed some Linux system on it, uh, dropped the LAMP stack on it, and basically redistributed the whole. Uh, the files to the whole dev team. So we've just grown and we became better at it because we now have powerful tools that can host powerful uh, virtual machines and now we also have uh, virtual machines wrappers like Pagrant and now we have provisioning tools like Puppet and Ansible. And the main question is why should you even virtualize your development environment because this isn't easy if you're doing it by yourself. So, first thing that you need to uh, think about is the development equals production. So when you do the development your local machine, you need to make sure that everything will work on the production. So maybe you're using the PHP 5.6 version on your local machine and the server that you will uh, host the project on runs PHP 5.3, which is not that uh, uh, unusual, basically. And if you transfer the code from your local machine to the production machine, everything will break down because PHP 5.6 has much more features that you probably used than the PHP version 5.3. So you need to be sure that your local development, development environment corresponds to the production environment. Also, uh, virtual machine configuration is now pretty easy because it's written in plain text form format which makes it uh, easy to read and update. And also the provisioning scripts that install all the things on the virtual machine are also in the plain text format so they're also easy to update and read. And it's easy to basically install everything once you have the virtual machine, virtual dev environment. And you just need to download VirtualBox or some other uh, virtualization application and download install Vagrant and type in one command. And the great thing about this is the mobility and consistency. Basically you create the dev box once and you can install it on as many machines as you wish so. Uh, you're pretty sure that every team, team member inside of your company has the same development environment so uh, you won't encounter any situations like it works on my machine, it doesn't work on mine, why is that? Because you use Windows, I use Mac and so on. And uh, once you delete the virtual machine you're sure that there are no leftovers on your machine. So you basically deleted all the services you, you don't wish to run on your laptop when you're not uh, developing on it. So uh, basically what uh, is a Vagrant file, it's basically a configuration file which you can define uh, which uh, operating system do you want to use, uh, on which IP address do you wish to, him, uh, to run it, maybe forward some ports and so on, you can name it and you can basically configure shell, shell for folders. And how many of you do you use Vagrant on any other set of visualization? Okay, just one. Okay, cool. So you should really want to consider using it because it's a pretty straightforward thing and you are basically resolving a large amount of problems that you might encounter when you're not using it. And this is a sample provisioning script. So basically you write, uh, this is written in YAML, but uh, it's used by Ansible provisioning software to install it on the machine. So basically this is a configuration file which installs Node.js on the dev machine. So we basically type in what you wish to name it, what you wish to install. Oh, I copied PHP. This should be PHP YAML, sorry. <laughs> this basically installs PHP 5 with all the other libraries like um, internalization, MySQL, CURL, MyCrypt. So you, this one file installs uh, five different things on the dev machine and it's written in plain text format. And it also replaces the default PHP in the file with the templated one which I created. And there are few virtualization options. So 
if someone is considering starting with the virtualization, there are a few options that you can uh, basically use. The, uh, there are a few uh, WordPress uh, boxes available and they are all open source. And the first one is very Vagrant Vagrants, which is a virtual box, the virtual machine that you can use to either work on the WordPress core or you can develop teams on it and basically run it. Uh, by tapping that vagrant up command. Uh, there's a VIP quick start, which is pretty useful if you wish to develop teams that will run on the WordPress VIP environment. Because WordPress VIP environment has a set of rules which you need to obey in order for your team to run at the WordPress VIP. So this virtual machine, I think, might help you develop teams to run on the WordPress VIP. And there's a new one, the VCCW, which is a open source uh, WordPress virtual box solution, which you can also use to develop teams. There are some, uh, unpop I wouldn't say unpopular, but less popular than the three above. Uh, and you can create your own custom box. And why not? You can use this URL, which can help you create one by using the graphical interface. You can just click on what you wish to enable on the demo machine. You can click through everything and click download and it will basically create the provisioning scripts that you need to create that demo machine. So version control. How many of you use Git, SVN or some other set? Okay. So half. Okay. So version control is also known as version control source control. Uh, by Wikipedia, it's managing to change to com documents, computer programs, blah, 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 and other collections of information. Uh, there are a few version control uh, uh, software solutions that you can use, uh, most popular being Git. There are also SVN, Mercur Mercurial, and there are also some paid ones for the enterprise solutions. Uh, basically, it allows developers to work on the same files at once without that fear of something being deleted by the other guy. Uh, it, ma it makes the code reviewing process much easier because you can basically track who made a certain change to the code. It's a great playing tool because you can know who crashed the production or something else. And Basically, with every version control, you need to have a repository, and there are a large number of uh, repository uh, hosted repository solutions, and these two are basically the most popular. Uh, GitHub for, let's say, open source projects, and Bitbucket for closed source projects for, de uh, for development companies, and so on. So, Git is basically a thing that you'll learn, learn through the rest of your life. You won't learn it at once, you won't learn it by reading, you basically memorize few commands and when something messes up you delete everything and paste it in and you start to all over and with time you'll memorize more and more commands and that's le that's basically learning git and git and wordpress well basically git and wordpress they get along just fine you'll just need to select what you wish to version it so basically you can version the whole project, you can uh, track changes to the WordPress core, for example, when you update it for, from one version to another, you can track changes uh, of that core files, you can track only themes which you develop, so that's useful when you are not interested in tracking the core, because you are sure that the core is being backed up with previous to any updates, and same thing applies to plugins, so basically you can tra either track or not track changes to plugins when you update them. If you do not, do not have any backup solution available, it's a good thing to basically track the changes to plugins because then you can easily revert back and basically uh, destroy the updates and revert to the previous version. And how you define which you, what you wish to track is defined by the git ignore file and VS Logic basically used the git ignore file uh, created by VP Engine. We basically used the slightly modified version of this file, so you can basically find it online. This is the VP Engine recommended git ignore file that ignores, uh, track, uh, that doesn't track the core files. It only checks the themes and plugins. Also, 
for you who use uh, Git or any other track, uh, version control solution, keep your commits small and understandable. So version control can uh, help you uh, track the changes which made a mess on the production. So you can easily revert back by having small and understandable commits and commits messages because they can help you find what's wrong with the code and you can switch back to the previous working version easily with those small files. If you basically create version 1 and you create version 1.1 which had lots and lots of changes, maybe new features and everything and you committed all those changes at once and pushed them uh, you won't be able to fix a certain feature, remove a certain feature from the version 1.5 because you basically committed the whole code at once and you can just revert back to the version 1.0 which is bad. Use git hunks. Uh, who knows what git hunks are? Well, basically when you change the file, your the git is, system is registered uh, it changes to lines of code and by using git hunks you can basically commit certain lines of code stage them and then commit them so if you change lines 5, 6, 7 and then 15, 16, 17 you don't need to, in the same file you don't need to commit this, the, the whole file at once you can just commit changes made to uh, first three lines or the second three lines and that's helpful when a certain feature is being developed and the second feature is being developed and they both use the same file. You can basically uh, commit first part of the file with the first feature and the second part of the file with the second feature. So when, when you decide to revert back the feature to may basically delete it because it destroyed production or something, you can do that and you won't remove the first three lines of code that are being used by the first feature. So these are useful. And you can use them by basically modifying the git add command and by adding patch attribute and specifying the file which you wish to uh, modify, basically stage a certain parts of the file. In this case we are just using git hunks within the functions PHP and the git will provide us an interface where, where we will choose which changes do we wish to, to change, stage and which won't. And one tip that I would like to share is to disable file editing. Basically when you're using Git and if you're using Git to maybe deploy things to the server, uh, there are certain scenarios where the client enters the WordPress administration, changes the code through the WordPress edit team editor, changes the code, maybe style CSS, functions, PHP, and you don't know that, and you deploy the new version of the code maybe a month later, and the client calls and says, uh, all my changes are overridden, uh, and you're asking yourself why, and then he says that he, he was using the WordPress theme editor in, in, for the backend code editing from WordPress. And you can do that by defining this little file edit to true and by doing this, the client won't be able to edit the team uh, source code through the WordPress administration. You can be sure that all the things you make on your computer won't override anything on the production or staging server. So this is a cool little command that I found maybe two, three weeks ago, which is pretty good. And embrace it. Basically for you who didn't use Git, you should start using Git. And it doesn't matter if you're a freelancer or a small company or a big company, you should start using it because it provides many things like reverting back to the older versions and so on. And Git is more than just Git push and Git pull or Git commit. Uh, I saw a lot, of, a lot of people using Git and not using it fully, not embracing the full, uh, full Git. So basically what I mean is there are certain things in Git like Git flow, GitHub workflow, Atlassian workflow, which is a slightly modified version of the Git flow. Uh, those are all flows that can help you develop better sites, better programs and so on. By uh, providing you a set of things that you can use in your own advantage, like creating branches for every feature. That way uh, one feature doesn't have to be done in order to the, for the whole code to be deployed to the production. If you're using the, uh, I would say the beginner's 
thing, uh, beginners com git commit the git co push code system, you would basically have your three, three members working on the same project and you will all commit changes to master and you wouldn't able to you won't be able to push that code from master to production until every feature on that branch is finished so you must be sure that every team member has done its feature in this way every feature is being developed on a separate branch and by doing so the master branch is always deployable and you can be sure because uh, once the team member finishes a certain feature, he will make a pull request or ask you to merge his changes to the master branch and you can then test it and deploy it to production. Also, you can create a separate branch which you can use to test the code before, uh, before uh, uh, merging those changes to master branch, which can be useful if you have a deployment system that basically deploys code every day at a certain point of time. In that way you need to have a deployable master branch. And you can also use Git with Vagrant. Basically you can uh, track uh, ver uh, version control the whole uh, virtual box solution, the, vir the whole virtual machine. And by doing so you can basically uh, revert the virtual, virtual box settings to the previous version because you messed something up on the virtual box and so on and you have a neat thing where you can employ a new guy uh, say to him just clone this repository and then type in this command and what happens is this you basically do nothing and everything is ready in 15 minutes and so we uh, will now talk about code quality control. And uh, code quality control is an important thing because people write code differently. Uh, some people are, are self-taught programmers and they have their own way of writing code. Other, people's, uh, other people came in from a different platform or maybe from a different language so they have a different set of rules that they obey. And other people basically started with WordPress but didn't catch up with the WordPress coding standards. So people like different coding styles. And uh, different coding styles lead to be bad code reading and understanding experience. Because you might have three team members working on the same files and one of those team members uses uh, tabs instead of spaces to uh, and then the code, the other one uses uh, camel case and the second one uses underscore system to name the functions and so on and if you try to read the code after three guys uh, have uh, modified it you will have some trouble understanding the code because uh, and you will also have that thing where someone uses eight spaces instead of four or something like that and then all of a sudden you will have one function that's four spaces indented the next function will have eight then maybe next one have two and you won't be uh, you won't be able to read the code that easily so it's important to be consistent with writing code and it's important to keep up with the coding standards and that's why we have WordPress and PHP coding standards which you can basically read from the WordPress documentation. And that's why some form of code review is important because if you have a project that's one year old and you need to come by it, you must be sure that you will be able to read it a year after you've developed it. Otherwise you will be freaking out when you try to read it. And this trip just illustrates how someone who is a self-taught programmer writes a code and he thinks to himself that he is right that that's the best way to write a code and then some other guy comes in and basically describes this code as practically garbage so this is xkcd strips so there are lots of development script uh, development strips available there so you can read them there as well uh, pull, pull request code review okay uh, half of you guys told me that they use git and uh, who uses pull requests okay small smaller number okay uh, with pull requests every feature should be developed uh, developed in a separate branch and once finished the developer submits a pull request to the master branch uh, what he does is he states okay my feature is done can you merge those changes back to uh, master branch and you can use this 
to practically inspect the code before you merge it to master. Uh, when you do so, developers can gather around and discuss the code to see if everything is okay and does everything follow the standards that the company uses. And pull requests gets either declined or approved depending on what other developers thought of it. Basically, you may, might have senior developers that need to approve the code before merging it in the master branch. And this is how it looks. So, for you who do, do not use pull requests, it's pretty simple. So, uh, you uh, go into a repository of your code, you start up with a new branch, you name it. So, every branch needs to have a name. It's uh, uh, good to describe the feature through the name of the branch and if you are using Jira which is also an Atlassian product like Bitbucket you can basically create branches directly from Jira and then Jira and Bitbucket can communicate in a way that you can track code changes on Jira and see how many lines of code have changed and so on and it will ha help you with the naming convention as well it will basically automatically create the branch name based on the Jira issue now, after you've done that, you can basically git fetch and git check out the new branch on your local repository. You can make some changes to the code and commit them. And once you push them, you will see that the code is, has been pushed to the rep uh, remote repository branch with the same name. And you will see this link, at least uh, you will see this link when you're using Bitbucket. So I just highlighted it here, I don't know how well you can see it, but basically it's right there. And you can just copy this code and paste it into your browser and it will create a pull request interface for you in which you can title the pull request, you can basically describe it and so on and you can choose to close the branch after, you pull, uh, after the code is, has been accepted to the master branch. And it also shows what you did with the code. So basically every commit uh, in the feature uh, branch is being displayed here. So every change with every commit is being displayed. Like a summary or something like that. Uh, neat thing about this is that you can uh, see the author, you can uh, specify uh, the reviewers. So you might have two or three reviewers there that need to first approve the pull request in order for it being merged to the uh, master batch. I didn't do that because this is my own repository so I didn't have any team members on it but basically you can just assign reviewers to the pull request and you can then merge the code after it's being uh, basically approved by all uh, reviewers you can the one of the reviewers or the lead devel developer or the senior developer will merge it to the master branch and it will close the source branch as well but this is too slow so you need to do all of this to just see the code changes and see does it uh, does it follow all the standards and if you have 10 feature branches and every feature branch has 100 relies of code change you will need to have programmers being in the room and discussing 100 times 100 <laughs> uh, change, uh, line changes. So it's simply too slow, it, it won't work. Especially if you need to deliver on a daily basis, which practically we all do. Uh, so there's another solution. So PHP CS plus git hooks. Uh, does anyone know what PHP CS is? It's PHP code sniffer. And Git hooks are basically way on which you can hook to Git events. Be be basically, when you type in Git command, uh, Git commit, or Git push command, there are certain events that happen before and after the command is being executed. And the thing that be uh, and when you execute the Git com commit command, you can write a script that will run before that com uh, that commit script become, uh, starts running and afterwards. So so let's start with the PHP code sniffer. PHP code sniffer tokenizes PHP, JavaScript and CSS files and detects violations of a defined uh, set of coding standards. So that's the definition of PHP code sniffer. 
and it can be easy as this. So you first need to install the PHP CS uh, tool. You can do it uh, through the uh, composer if anyone uses it, or you can use it, uh, install it through pair pack engine system. Uh, you basically invoke the command, define which standard you wish to use and on which files do you wish to use it on. So this is the example of the small command that you can use. And this can be uh, written in a different way. So you can basically you search for all the PHP files in a certain folder and just ignore files from the ink folder because you might have a library or two that are not obeying the standards so there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, within a certain, you can do it within a certain team. For example, we are doing this to 2016 team. And to do so, you need to basically download the WordPress coding standards for PHP code sniffer, and you can download them from the GitHub. The WordPress, WordPress has provided the set of rules that you can use with the PHP code sniffer. And as I said, uh, as I said, Git hooks fire up scripts when important events occur, like commit and push and non-zero status aborts the commit. So if the script returns the non-zero response, the commit will abort and someone will not be able to commit the code. And there, there's a large amount of resources that you can use just by typing the code uh, quality control through git hooks or uh, and PHP code sniffer and you'll, you'll find a large amount of resources that you can use to implement such a system in your development environment. And the, here is this one link that I found that's pretty useful. It deals with PHP coding standards, not WordPress, but you can easily update it to uh, work with PHP coding standards as well. And this is what PHP code sniffer does. So you type in the command and PHP code sniffer with WordPress coding standards returns this form of response and it tells you what's wrong with a certain files. So you can see that 2016 team doesn't follow WordPress standards, which is pretty unusual, but it doesn't. So there is a list of errors that you can see, a list of warnings, and you can use the, that list to basically uh, fix the team and you, you can then make sure that that team is following the WordPress coding standards. And if every team member does that, you're pretty damn sure that everyone will understand the code when reading it. And w when you combine this with git pre-commit hook, I didn't make a demo of that, but if you combine this with the script, which is pretty big, but you can find it in the link that I provided, and someone tries to commit to that, uh, doesn't follow the standards, it won't pass. So it won't be able to commit the code before he fixes. Uh, the lines of code that needs to be fixed by the WordPress coding standards. And you can, by, define, by writing the script down, the pre-commit script, you can define how you wish to display those errors to the programmer, do you wish to display them at all, etc. And there's even integrations with the IDEs that basically uh, ca capture the response from the uh, command and display it within the IDE. And there are other types of code control. Uh, co code quality control like VAP scanner, team checker, and ID integrations for, for example, PHP store. And last but not least is the state of the art toolbox. So I st said that uh, everyone has a certain set of tools that they like, and that's great because tools help us do things better and faster. And there's a large number of tools, for example, for front-end developers that they, they can use to write the code better and to make scripts uh, smaller and so on, and like GoodKit, Koala, Compass, Scrunch. But using different tools within the same team is bad. So you might have two, three, uh, four, five, it doesn't matter, front-end developers that use different tools. So for example, let's say that the first front-end developer uses GoodKit and the second developer cannot use CodeKit because it's not supported on the Windows machine. So you have a problem. Uh, one developer cannot work with the other on the same project. So the thing that needs to be done is standardization and consistency across all the projects and all machines. And another thing that can help is automation, but we can use automation to basically uh, do, uh, let the machine do the otherwise manual work that we would need to do every hour or on every project and so on. 
And these are some of the tools that can help you do that. The WordPress CLI tool is a tool that you can use with WordPress development. You can use it to either update the plugins, uh, update the team core, even install the WordPress on your demo machine or something like that. And you can use certain plugins through it, like WordPress Migrate Database, WordPress Regenerate Thumbnails. So you have scripts that you can use to automate that stuff. It's a pretty neat tool. I don't know how many of you use it, but it's definitely worth of trying. The another set of tools that can help you do things better is Node.js and npm. And I know that WordPress.com has switched to the Node.js system, and this is not it. So basically, we use Node.js to run and npm to run scripts on our own machines to do certain stuff. So it's easier to write automation scripts in JavaScript than in Ruby for us who deal with WordPress because we write JavaScript on a daily basis. So it's nice to have a, a language that we can use to write JavaScript automation scripts on our machines. NPM is a package manager for downloading packages for Node.js. And one of those packages is Gulp. We use it daily. We basically implemented a system which automates automated systems. So we automated Gulp by creating a certain configuration file, then Gulp reads that configuration file and does everything. But Gulp basically is a streaming tool. You have a certain set of files on one side, you have a script in the middle, and you have the result in the other side. And that script in the middle can basically you uh, read the file contents, minify it, uh, maybe transform less to CSS and so on, and output it as a single file. And I don't know how many of you use Gulp or grunt or something like that. Okay, so basically it helps you deal with larger number of scripts. And if you have a large project, there is a big chance that you use more than 10 JavaScript files. Or if you use jQuery, Modernizer, uh, I don't know, uh, Slick Slider or something like this, uh, you, have, you already have three files. And you can use Gulp to basically take uh, the content of those three files, minify it and output it as a single file and then the site won't have to load 10, 15 files, it will just have to load one or two files on the site, which will practically make your site faster because it will load faster. And if you use some form of CDN with it, you, won't, uh, you will have massive improvement on the page load, uh, page load uh, time. And Wormo, that's a practically a new project. I didn't see it before. I didn't see it when I started working with WordPress, but it helps you migrate the WordPress uh, instances. So if you are doing development on your local machine, you can use WordPress to basically deploy the code to the production or deploy the new uploads that you made on your local machine to the production. And you can you also sync up everything. So you can pull new uploads from the server from the production server and then you can work with the new uh, files and it will also pull contents from the database so you will pull new articles from the site and you can push new articles from your machine to the site which is pretty good because WordPress uh, relies on the database heavily so uh, there, there is a it's good to have a tool that helps you deal with that problem because sometimes you when you have few developers working on the same project and they all need to work with the same articles which they can use to practically create maybe page templates for different types of pages. It's good to have a tool that helps you uh, sync up all developers at once. So you can practically sync up with every developer by pushing new uploads to their computers and pulling new uploads to your computer and also records from the database. So it's a pretty good tool. I didn't have any time to investigate it fully, but we used it on a last project and it seems to have uh, working just fine. It can use FTP, SFTP and SSH as a uh, protocol to deploy files to the production. So if you are working with multiple environments, for example, we mostly work with VP Engine, which has, which has its own deployment system, but we sometimes use like uh, different, uh, maybe shared hosts or, or our own host hosted on digital ocean and so on. So it's a good to have a single tool that helps you deal with all platforms. So it helps you deal with VP engine, shared hosts and your own droplets at the digital ocean. So you have the same experience 
uh, when deploying files to any of those environments, which is helpful because I already stated that consistency is important when working in a team that's growing. And last but not least is a composer, which is not being used with WordPress that much because WordPress has a different vendoring system. But uh, Composer ba basically helps you install different libraries and by libraries I mean different projects uh, written in PHP and implementing it into your own project. But you can use Composer to install PHP code sniffer for example. You can have a single Composer file uh, which states that you wish to install compo uh, PHP code sniffer and it also allows you to create scripts, so you can have a script run when all the packages are being installed. So if you want to install, install PHP code sniffer, for example, you can tell him, okay, first install the PHP code sniffer library, then import the WordPress coding standards, and then run something else. So it's definitely worth checking out, even if you're when <laughs> you are working with WordPress, I hope, and. Uh, See if you can use it to practically improve your development, uh, development uh, environment and development workflow. I used it before and I still use it sometimes. And there are also a few plugins that you can use when developing like the bug bar which can help you track uh, the backend stuff what happened during the request response sequence. So you can see what SQL queries were being were executed during your last request. You can see which template file is being opened, which is helpful if you don't know if the R high PHP is being opened or maybe single or a single uh, single post or a single page or a single custom post type page template. So you can use it to basically debug the whole request and the response that the WordPress gave. There is also the advanced custom fields plugin that we use to create uh, custom fields and method boxes. And force regenerate thumbnails is a basically plugin that we push to every production site in order for us to quickly regenerate all the thumbnails if we uh, push the new code change which defines the new image size. So we use this plugin to basically regenerate all the thumbnails and we use it, we basically run uh, the command of the re uh, thumbnail regeneration in the time when there are less visitors to the site, which is also important. You wish to run those scripts when there are less people on the site because those scripts can be really heavy. And log deprecated notices is a plugin that uh, checks if you are using uh, if you are using functions in your team that are deprecated and that will be removed in any future version of WordPress, which is great if you are developing teams that will be maintained for a year or two or more, you must have this kind of control that you're to be sure that you're not using deprecated functions when you're within your team or a plugin. Also, final thoughts and tips. So I, uh, for example, stated that advanced custom uh, fields is a plugin that we use. And the thing is that lots of people use it, but people use it in the wrong way. So uh, when you're using a plugin that provides a graphical interface to create custom post types, custom meta boxes and fields, those stuff, that stuff is being stored in the database. And that's great when you're working alone, and that's great when you're sure that you will be the only guy who will push changes to production. But that's uh, not good if you're working on a project where multiple features are being developed at once. Because if you are working on the same feature or a different feature that uses the same set of meta boxes with another developer, you won't be able to uh, easily transfer changes that you done to the meta boxes to the other programmer which can be bad uh, also if you're creating custom post types with a graphical interface it can be bad to work in a team like that so if you create a set of custom post types which uh, you need to then uh, push so the other developer can use them to create maybe meta boxes for them it can be tough when you're working in a system which stores the custom post types in a database. So, I don't know how many of you use advanced custom uh, fields plugin, 
or any plugin that basically helps you create custom post types. No one? Okay, <laughs> even better. But uh, Advanced Custom Fields uh, plugin has a hidden system. I wouldn't say hidden, but it's not that uh, visible. Uh, which it allows you to store the configuration of meta boxes in a JSON file, which you can then track and push to the Git repository. And when other developers pull the code, their ACF plugin installed on their WordPress instance will recognize the changes made to the JSON files, and it will tell them to sync up your uh, their own fields with your own field uh, with your fields that you pushed a minute or two earlier. So it's good to have that kind of system where everything is being tracked through some form of code or JSON configuration files, so you can be sure that everyone's using. Uh, the same fields and same custom post types. And another thing that I would like to uh, st say in this part is don't grow too fast. So don't employ too many people at once. Be sure to employ, uh, employ people one by one because things can break and the whole workflow can go down just like that. So be sure that you're hiring smart and that you're not growing too fast. Okay, so that's it. I covered pretty much a large, a large number of topics. I didn't want to go in depth with everything. So if you have any sort of questions or maybe you're interested in a certain part of the presentation, you can either ask me a question now. I believe we have two or three minutes left or you can approach me later on so we can discuss what's bothering you or if you have any additional suggestions, maybe. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm a beginner to WordPress. Okay. Okay. So I'm not an, and as a designer, I'm, I'm not a coder, and I'm not a developer. So I'm interested in designing WordPress sites. I don't understand how this fits in. Uh, yeah, this is the development process by uh, yeah programmer. Right. How does that work? How is that incorporated into the WordPress whole thing? I design a site. How, yeah. how, how, how does this all fit? In? Uh, uh, so. Yeah, so basically uh, in our uh, company we get the designs finished. So they send us all the designs. The designer does. Yeah, designer does or the company who does the design sends us the designs. And we do things by those designs. And if everything changes in the middle, they need to send us a new version which we will inc inc incorporate in the new version of the code. Okay. So in designers are not integrated. <laughs> Sorry. Learning more stuff. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Thank you. And yeah. Yeah. What are a couple of uh, one or two uh, things I can do to like uh, the biggest pain be about uh, things inside your workflow? Ah. Okay. So uh, automation is a biggest swing that we have. Currently, so when we first started uh, with WordPress, when I came into the company, it took us like 30 or 45 minutes to basically set the whole project up. Now it takes just five minutes because we have a uh, init script that prepares all the projects. So I would say that the automation is the basically hardest part, but it's also the uh, thing that it can help you if you are dealing with large number of projects. So I would say that and incorporating the good, uh, Git uh, flow by Atlassian is also the thing that helped us because we were able to de deliver projects in a phase sequence. So we didn't have to deliver all at once. We could have features started in when the version 1.1 uh, was, uh, was released and those features uh, were able to be developed through the few versions until being merged into a certain version. So we didn't have to wait for the feature to be done in, uh, for uh, so we could push the code online. So that's the thing that helped us as well. So for automation, do you mean like the uh, army uh, deployment process or more like the uh, Yeah, so uh, automating the Git flow. So you, can, you also have scripts that can help you with for example, Git flow, if you Google it, the first thing that you will see is a script that helps you uh, incorporate that kind of flow into your project. So you just type in, there are a few commands that you can use, you can just type in that you wish to develop a new feature and it will create everything to, for you to do so. And you, uh, at one moment you will say, I wish to 
um, deploy those features and it will pro it will basically do everything in the background uh, but it will basically merge those changes into the master branch for example okay I don't know if I made one last one okay Yeah. For example, we want to build the web application. We, um, I want to call the data that uses three different languages. Uh, PHP, HP, ML, yeah. CSS. Yeah. Then can be accessed by iPhone and the Android phone. Okay. So for this project, they require the three different languages. So you can uh, use the PHP core sniffer to. Uh, to, uh, to basically uh, tokenize both J JS and PHP files and uh, so that means that you can store the PHP, HTML and JavaScript code within the same repository and also the Gulp system that I mentioned earlier or some other form of automation with, uh, for assets can uh, be stored, used with the same, for example, Gulp can minify both JS files, CSS files, and do something with them. And uh, also, we can use it for PHP by automating certain things with the PHP code, for example. And all that means that you can store PHP, JS, and HTML code in the same repository, but you won't store, for example, Java code or uh, Objective C or something like this you will create a separate repository because those languages, those kind of projects require a different workflow. Mm -hmm. So you won't sto store them in the same repository. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. If you have any other questions, uh, just approach me later on, so I will be happy to answer anything or help you or talk to you about your ideas or anything else. Thank you.